July 2nd, 1997. Somebody will listen to me. He was an American original. I never saw a frame of film in which I felt that Jimmy was, quote, acting, where the acting showed. And I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet, and I'm going to see the world. He was someone we could all identify with. He was a very generous, amiable, intelligent, perceptive man. Get me back. I don't care what happens to me. Get me back to my wife and kids. I'd, I'd like people to remember me as someone that was good at his job and seemed to mean what he said. To my big brother George, the richest man in town. I've had a wonderful life. I thank God for it. Tonight, a wonderful life, remembering Jimmy Stewart. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. I don't think it's just imagination or nostalgia at work here. There was a time in the history of American entertainment from the mid-late 30s to the early 50s, before television really took hold, when the Hollywood Dream Factory was at its peak. It still creates blockbusters and stars, but it has never again played as large a role in the fabric of American life. The illusions that the industry created back then went far beyond the stories it put on the screen. It wasn't just the film images that were bigger than life. It was the whole gossamer web of illusions that went into the creation of Hollywood's biggest stars. A handsome young Englishman by the name of Archibald Alexander Leach became Cary Grant. A tall, rangy, broad-shouldered young man by the name of Marion Robert Morrison somehow emerged from the Hollywood processing machine as John Wayne. William Clark became Clark Gable, and each took his special place in the galaxy. But there was also a handful of stars who kept not only their own names in one form or another, they also seemed to be playing themselves. Two of them have died within the past 24 hours. Robert Mitchum, who always carried a little of that don't-give-a-damn attitude into every role he portrayed. He got busted and briefly jailed a couple of times. That only served to enhance the image. Robert Mitchum died yesterday. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there was the personification of good old down-to-earth, give-you-the-shirt-off-his-back, plain-spun American values. That was Jimmy Stewart. He died today. He was 89. You have the advantage on me. You know my name, and I don't know yours. And, and right back at me, he said, what name do you like? Well, I, I didn't even have to think twice about that. Harvey's always been my favorite name. But I've never been very good at uh, learning lines. It's always been a very hard task for me. I, I don't think I consciously uh, went about to ham and haw and stutter and do... do, do, do. I, I, uh, th th this I don't remember. I, I think uh, having it tough to learn my lines and get down wonderful in my lines had a lot to do with it. The hamming and hawing and the stuttering and everything, I was thinking, thinking about what, what I said next. And th th this is, this is the, the interesting thing about the whole thing. He said, what a coincidence. My name happens to be Harvey. But Jimmy Stewart did pretty well for a man who couldn't remember his lines. He became one of our greatest film actors with a screen persona based on a kind of all-American ordinariness. He was the everyman who could play anyone. And that required remarkable range. I think people now think of Jimmy Stewart as a kind of uh, drawling everyman, a kind of uh, grumpy good guy who uh, came from a small town and and represents these kind of traditional American values, but, but actually there's another side of Jimmy Stewart that is anguished and obsessive. After all, there are two sides to the American dream. There's the dream and then there's the nightmare. And I think that Stewart expressed both uh, in his range. He was a thorough actor. 
a complete actor and he was stage trained. He could play the romantic lead with a light comic touch. And I'd like to take this opportunity, Miss Novak, to inform you that I don't walk like a duck and I'm not bow-legged. Aren't you? No, I'm not. The hard-bitten cowboy of his westerns. <laughs> the haunted and obsessed men of his Hitchcock films. And perhaps his most beloved incarnation, the plain-talking, romantic idealists of the Frank Capra films, like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Well, I'm not late. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause, even if this room gets filled with lies like these. Jimmy Stewart, the, the, the Western star, he made a lot of Western movies. He did, and uh, again... As an example of his versatility, the, the idea that somebody who could look at home uh, in the drawing rooms of the Philadelphia story and, and equally at home on, on the back of a horse, uh, you know, holding a rifle. I don't like tricks myself, so that makes us even. In a 1987 documentary with Johnny Carson, Jimmy Stewart talked about why he made the switch to Western movies shortly after returning from service in World War II. I think it was just, uh, I'd matured, yeah. you know, four and a half years away and that much older, and I, I think I just uh, matured also uh, three flop pictures uh, convinced me that I'd better do something. What do you think Westerns mean to most people? Why have Westerns been so popular over the years? Well, I think... Partly, it's, it's, it's sort of a history of our country. Right. It's sort of, uh, this is when our country was growing up. And uh, I think it, they're popular all over the world, and I think for the same reason, because I think everybody in all parts of the world, they're interested in this country and how it was settled. Stewart's best known and most loved film may well be It's a Wonderful Life. Stewart said that when director Frank Capra phoned him to describe the project, he was immediately intrigued. It was Frank Capra, and he said, I have an idea for a story. Why don't you come down, and, and I'll, uh, I'll tell, it, tell it to you. Well, I couldn't get down there quick enough, and I sat down, and he said, you're a uh, fellow in a small town. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet, and I'm going to see the world. Yeah, then you get married, you have all these kids. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Daddy. And your father dies, and you have to take over the building Four, alone. Three, two, one, bingo! We made it! And uh, finally, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to jump off a bridge. And an angel by the name of Clarence, he comes down to help you, but uh, he can't swim. Help! Well, you go down and uh, save the... He said, this, this really doesn't sound very good, does it? I said, Frank, if you, want, if you want me to be in a picture about a guy that wants to kill himself and an angel comes down named Clarence and he can't swim and I say, I, I, when do we start? When it was released was not a smash hit. It, it I think, was perhaps a little too dark for uh, post-war audiences. Uh, it's only later on, uh, especially when it was shown on TV so often, that it became this kind of yuletide smash. If you were to see one Jimmy Stewart movie in terms of the kinds of things that he can do as an actor, that would be the one. A toast <laughs> to my big brother George, the richest man in town. <laughs> In the 1940s, reality intruded on Jimmy Stewart's Hollywood, and soon his art would imitate his life. How about you, young man? Huh? How about you? Can I fly in your airplane? Oh, I'm afraid not. You have to stay home, take care of your mother. And you be a good girl now and don't cause him too much trouble. Well, I'll try not to. You take care of yourself. During the Second World War, a lot of Hollywood stars worked with and for the military, but most of them never left California. Big band leader Glenn Miller was one of those who did. In fact, he died in Europe when his plane disappeared. When Jimmy Stewart played the role in the Glenn Miller story, he brought another dimension to the part. He had flown as a bomber pilot during that same war. I was drafted 
I keep saying that's the only lottery I've ever won. You know, there are five, six, seven million people. And my number was 380. I went to go for a physical, and uh, I weighed 130 pounds. And they say, you don't weigh enough. Movie actor Jimmy Stewart shows the results of his new diet. He gained 10 pounds, enough to pass the Army's requirements. So now he's in camp, ready to be turned into a soldier. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to be here. I'm going to do my very best to be useful as a soldier in the United States Army. Stewart had been an avid pilot before he was drafted. He was eventually put in command of a bomber squadron in Europe flying combat missions over Nazi-occupied territory. Oh, I did just as much as everybody else. I mean, you, everybody is scared. And you just had to handle that and uh, afraid a lot. Thirteen years younger than Jimmy Stewart was a young sergeant who served under Colonel Stewart's command. Staff Sergeant Walter Matthau, 12062683. Now, you were telling me a story before. Uh, I find it hard to believe that a man as amiable and genial as you would get into trouble with some other colonel, but apparently you did. I guess I was insubordinate, and this other colonel wanted to have me shot. Uh, Jimmy Stewart saved my life. He said, no, let's not shoot him. Let's send him on detached service over to France. So Jimmy Stewart saved your life? I would say that. After the war, Jimmy Stewart joined the Air Force Reserve, ultimately rising to the rank of Brigadier General. At least one of his Hollywood friends did considerably better. He became Commander-in-Chief. Here he is, Ronald Reagan. The MC would introduce Jimmy Stewart, and then Jimmy would introduce me. And in almost every instance, the MC would stress Jimmy's picture career at all. And... I would get up and then sort of say my apologies to the MC, but in Hollywood, we think uh, another side of Jimmy Stewart, too, and then I would go into his war record, and I would wind up saying Major General Jimmy Stewart. And then one night, we got there, and the MC did include his war record and finished saying Brigadier General Jimmy Stewart. So I got up and said, I apologize, but Major General Jimmy Stewart. On account of he's a major general in the Air Force Reserve. <laughs> we got back to the hotel that night, and Jimmy caught up with me, and he said, uh, uh, Ron, uh, he said, that that, that fellow t tonight was right. Uh, it, it is Brigadier General. <laughs> he said, I, I just never corrected you because it sounded so good. <laughs> <laughs> After the war, Jimmy Stewart had gone back to acting. One day in 1948, a new generation showed up on the lot in the person of Tony Curtis. The cameraman, Eddie Estabrook, asked uh, Jimmy if he would take a picture with me, greeting me to the studio. And I have that photograph, which uh, meant really a lot to me. It was the first day at the studio and the first movie star that I saw while I was out there. By the next year, 1949, Jimmy Stewart was 41. He married for the first and last time. When I married Jimmy, I had two boys. They were very young. Uh, I think four and three or something like that. And um, Jimmy was just a naturally good father. He was willing to listen and play with them and threw the football. And when the twins were born, he was just as natural with them. There was no difference to Jimmy between the stepchildren and, and his own at all. Uh, it was in 1969, our son was, uh, oldest boy, was in Vietnam. He was a Marine. He wanted to be a Marine. He wanted to, and I, and I encouraged him. I thought that was wonderful. And he became a good Marine. And on the field of battle, he conducted himself in a gallant manner. And I don't think that's a tragedy. It's a loss. It's like what I do. It's a terrible, terrible loss. A tragic? No. He he died for his country. In the end, there's probably no one better to sum up Jimmy Stewart's life than Jimmy Stewart. Oh. Uh -huh. 
goodbye, Steve. And you're working for a major studio on those Mr. days. Mr. Goodbye. You went to work every day, then a six-day a week. It's all right, sis. I guess I have to If you come weren't uh, on a little goodbye. part and a big picture, or a big part on a little picture. And please don't call me Cornelius, Uncle Elmer. I told you a hundred times the fellas all call me Corn. I like that. There were I times there where I, I actually had parts in three pictures at once. I don't want a single move out of any one. You learn your craft by working at it. You can't help yourself. You'll get so that you won't want a husband and a home and kids until it's too late. This was with Gene Harlow, something that was sort of a goodbye scene. We were going to kiss goodbye. And at the end of the rehearsal, Gene kissed me. Well, I, she, I'd never been kissed like that before. I can't she really that. let me have it. And uh, this was only the rehearsal. Uh, Clarence God, Brown was directing. And Clarence Brown said, all right, are, are we ready for a take? And this was better than the last one. <clears throat> he let me do it three times. F four times counting the rehearsal. And uh, she was a good kisser. Oh, come on. Oh, Reggie. Oh, you must be plum tuckered out. Marlene Dietrich knew. Get out before I kiss She knew everything about making movies. We were doing a scene when she said, remind me to tell you something after we do this scene. You sure have a knack of making a stranger feel right at home, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> nice knowing you. She just said, when you're looking at somebody and talking to them, don't try to look at both eyes at the same time. Either look at one eye or the other. Well, when you're, in, when you're being photographed, look at the person's downstage eye. In other words, just concentrate on one eye because it's impossible to look somebody straight in the eyes and l l look at both eyes at the same time. You can't do it. Stewart won the Oscar in 1940 for his role in the Philadelphia story. Thank you very much, sir. It's a great thrill to me to receive this trophy. It was about 3.45 when I got home, and the phone rang, and it was my father. And he said, here on the, the radio, they, they gave you a prize or something. What is it, a plaque or, or a, a statue? What, what, what kind of a prize is it? I told him it was sort of a statue, and he said, well... Send it home to me, and I'll put it in this, uh, the, the uh, hardware store window. So the next day, I got it, and I packed it up and sent it. It was there for 20 years. And so we'll start right out by seeing if we can put you in the mood. <laughs> To prepare for his part in the Glenn Miller story, Stewart needed to learn to play the trombone. Joe Ugal was his instructor. After three days of practicing everything, Joe came and said, Jim, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm going to have to uh, quit. I said, what? what's the matter, Joe? He said, well, the sounds that come out of that horn when you blow it have so affected me that I... Uh, I, I just can't take it a minute. I, I kicked my dog last night when I came home. I've never kicked my dog in, in my life. I yelled at my wife. She's, she ran out as though I was going to shoot her. I, it, everything is just, uh, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. And I said, well, what if we plug up the mouthpiece so that I can't possibly make any sound? Well, wouldn't that work? Well, he, he took to it right away. You'll be seeing me. Every time you bed down through the night, you'll look back into the darkness and wonder if I'm there. And some night I will be. I wanted to do as much of the action as I could. And uh, as far as doing stunts and westerns and so on, I, I did most of the riding. But uh, certain things, certain action things, there's one thing in Man from Laramie. As a matter of fact, I suggested this, that the bad guys uh, lasso me and pull me through the fire. And they said, boy, that's fine. And I said, well, let's get, get it done. And they said, well, you suggested it, why don't you do it? Oh, 
I don't think you ever stop learning to act. I think if you can do a part and not have the acting show, then, then believability starts sneaking in. And if you get those people down in the audience believing what's going on up there, well, then you're in pretty good shape. Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids! Help me, Terrence, please! How would you like to be remembered? Well, I'm a guy that believed in hard work and decent values and love of country and love of family, love of community, love of God. There was also a vivacious lady born to dance, the last gangster, the gorgeous hussy, and speed. No, not that one. This one was made in 1936. In fact, Jimmy Stewart made more than 20 pictures between 1935 and 39 alone, most of which were not memorable. Over the course of 46 years, Jimmy Stewart appeared in about 80 movies. Now, that's a body of work. The miracle is that so much of it was so good. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. <laughs>